whether it should be here tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> about four. Yeah, about four. Right <laughs> about now we're going to have to go. It'll be absolutely gorgeous. For those of you that don't know, this is Greg Connors with Hobie Cat. Greg, I get to talk to you regularly. He, uh, he basically helps to run things in the kayak delivery department when he's not busy going out spanking people on the race course with uh, categories. Rick, would you like to give these guys a little rundown of your uh, uh, yeah. resume? Sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Greg Thomas uh, from San Diego. I work at the Hobie Factory. I uh, started at Hobie Cat all the way back in 1983, just recreationally with the family every weekend down in San Diego. Uh, and back then, uh, kind of was a big time for Hobie Cat where we were getting. 350 votes that were gotten. We had a huge board in San Diego. We had like 400 members. We would have our meeting in the San Diego Yacht Club every, once, every Friday, once a month. So it was pretty cool back then. So growing up, um, I was able to tell with a bunch of the top guys in the world. I was able to tell with all their brothers, Calvin Agusta, he made it back in the 80s and 70s, the guys made it. That's what I did. Grew up, grew up with all the hot guys. I did that from uh, about 85 until 95, and very successful with all those guys. And then uh, that same year, I graduated college and decided to go full time sailing. So I did two Olympic campaigns on tornadoes. So from 94 until 2000, I was a full time sailor racing tornadoes, trying to make it to the Olympics. I did two Olympic trials and uh, didn't make it to the Olympics, but we were very successful and got close. So right at the end of that, um, I actually grew up around the Hobie Cat Company also, which was right in my backyard, so I knew all the, the people that worked there, and when I was in the middle of the campaign, or right towards the end, um, Doug, the president, approached me and asked me to work for the company to help with the sub sales and try and help promote the sub and see how you are you guys. So I've been working for them since 1999, so it's 14 years now. Wow. So, yeah, a lot of experience, uh, mostly in catamarans. I sailed in college also, so I've done a bunch of dinghy sailing and big boat sailing. But I love this catamaran sailing, so I always come back to that. And uh, I know I probably see most of you. I don't remember all the names from all the years, but um, I've been going to nationals. I think my first nationals was in 1988 or 1989. I've been doing one or two a year, so a lot of experience under my belt. Um, I still on most of the boats that are sailing here. The only one that I don't really have experience on is the movie. So I will need that to fill and to answer any questions for that. It's a good practice. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Hobie 18, that was my first boat that I ever sold with the family. Uh, so I'm really familiar with that. That was the hot boat back in the 80s and early 90s for me. And then it turned into the Hobie 20. And then the Hobie 20 basically from the first national through like 2000 or 2001. Um, so I'm familiar with that boat. And the Hobie 16, I still kind of recreationally on and off for the past few years past uh, for 20 years, whatever, uh, but it's only in the past three or four years that I got really serious about it. Um, I won the U.S. title in 2009, which qualified me for the Pan American Games. So in 2011, I think it was, I was the U.S. representative for the Pan Am Games down in Mexico. So it was a pretty special experience. Kind of the, the Olympics for the South American countries, and so that was a pretty good experience. And, um, really uh, I don't really have anything prepared for today. Um, I mean, I can talk about anything you like. We can. What I was thinking is, um, I would kind of be open to questions and kind of see where this thing goes. And then tomorrow morning, if anybody's interested, um, we can say like 9.30 or 10 o'clock. I'm not sure what time racing is supposed to start tomorrow, but we can go to a boat early in the morning and I can go over to some rigging tips. Like, and rigging the boat. So if anybody's interested in that, spread the word. We can figure out a time. Oh, it's in a couple of things, so I don't get it. <laughs> 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 I'm getting ready to back out of this. <laughs> 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 I will be here for you. Know, I will be here for you. I will be here for you. I will be here for you. I will be I'll be in my boat. I'll be rigging my boat. Um, I have a couple of issues today, so I'm going to be working on that. If you want to come, join me. See how I read my boat and then ask questions and like if we have time before the racing starts, I can come over to your boat and look it over and give any tips or hints or some clues or whatever it may be. Uh, so, I have a question. Yeah. Would it be 
okay if I left you with this mommy who would go downstairs and make some wrong drinks for everybody? Yeah. 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 Bring it back. Okay. 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 Put the 
you have for the forward, for the back, for their inboard, for their outboard. And my crew and I, we just found one setting and we actually fixed the jib block to the trampoline. So we couldn't move the forward, we couldn't move the back. Um, so basically on OB20, as you round the mark, you, you want the jib or both the jib and the skipper? I mean, jib and the main cell position. No, the main cell, I think you done. But I'm thinking, now I'm looking at my sequence of what I'm doing and what, what I can do to help okay. improve the transition from yeah. when we're just moving. Well, the most important thing, I think, as you're rounding the marks, is getting the jib out. Right. Especially when you get more wind, you want to get your weight back and get that jib out. So that's number one priority. Number two priority, I would say, as you're rounding, is to just get the wind report up. And then um, once the jib is kind of set in the ballpark where you think it's going to be, down and all out, call that It doesn't matter what order, just get those three done as quick as possible. And then barber hauler on the jib. Get it all the way out, and then everything else is kind of the. Do you have the uh, master case where you can lock it, or did it just free flow? Uh, I've got it where well, I've got the positive bunching system. Okay, so if you let it off, it goes out. It goes out. out. Okay, so yeah, so jib sheet out, jag board up, down haul, out haul, master rotation in any other order, barber haul around the gym, and then depending on the wind, you want to go down and get the motor board either all the way up or halfway up because you guys still know the wild thing down the middle of the Yeah, yeah. You are. So depending on the one, probably halfway up or something. What about the jib powder? Are you suggesting it at all? Not really. No. No. If it's um if it's really light, we might adjust it. Um, we can pull the wrinkles out going up the wind and down the wind, put it all the way up. But in this kind of wind today or anything more than that, just keep it set as it is. Yeah. And then once you get going downwind, kind of what I was telling you before with the jibs, just get that barber hauler out and set the jib to what feels good, and then the skipper will, uh, I mean, if you're doing the wild thing, you're probably doing a lot of steering, in which case you probably have to play the jib sheet a little bit more than the OB-16 or OB-18 where you kind of set it and forget it. Uh, yeah, with flying the hole downwind for a while, then you should probably come up quite a bit and you're going down quite a bit. So probably Trying to play the dude a little bit more, and that's just keeping the touch house flowing. So at the same time, you want to that yeah. And then with wild thing, also you're down on the lower side, getting here. Yeah, more good. Yours is down. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Anything else? So it's 
difficult to fail, but when you get it going right, it's very rewarding. You, you kind of know the journey you go on that boat, so it goes right. There's no hell, and you just kind of freeze up and pop together. But um, but I love the movie 16. I'll probably stay on the movie 16 from here on out. Um, I've all my serious sailing in the past and been too serious. And, and so now it's all just for fun for me. Just be able to come to these riottas and help out and help teach the fleet and grow the fleet. And, So what we got to see now on the horse day, it seemed like it was pretty consistent. Um, we were seeing early in the morning, it was kind of more to the left, and as the afternoon went on, the first two races, it kind of gradually went to the right a little bit. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people were banging that corner. Mm -hmm. Back right early, corner. banging that corner on the right-hand side. Yeah. Jimmy, and they come in, and it's flying in. Yeah. Like Harvard, yeah. yeah. And then in the afternoon, it seemed like it was right, and then it went left a little bit right before, like, maybe halfway through that last race. So how do you guys judge, um, like, what the wind's going to be? Any yeah. idea? That's a good like question. Like, you're going to run and just see what, yeah. what kind of angle you're doing. Exactly. So, you're so it's really easy on lakes like this right. where you have land surrounding you. So what I do, like, before the start line, when I'm just out there, I go off, like, through the start line, sheet in like I'm going to win drive out if I have to, just my normal F1 angle, and I look at the shore above, above me, and I see what I'm pointing at. And then go on the port jack, sell, and see what I'm pointing at. And depending on like how serious you've been on it, since it's the World Champions or something, we'll get out there an hour before the racing starts. And we'll do that every 10 minutes or so, just to try and get an idea of what the wind's doing. But here, you just kind of go out and do it once, and kind of get a general idea. And every time you come around that gate, whether you go out on starter tack or port tack, you should really pay attention to where you're pointing in reference to that first time that you went through there. So you go through there once before the start, you go the same way at the start, you get those two reference points, and then as you go through the gates, whether you go one or the other, you still have that same reference point. So then you get a general idea of what the wind is doing. So by doing that today, it was pretty easy to tell that the wind was pretty consistently going to the right all day. Just by looking at not only your boat, what you're doing, but if you pay attention to, like if you're coming down when you're trying to figure out which way to go up with, you can look at the boats that were are going up with currently and see where they're pointing uh, as far as where you were last time. And then it kind of gives you an idea where you go. So, yeah, and lakes like this is nice and easy to do. When you get sailing on the ocean, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out what's going on because it's just gray space out there. So. That's where um, having little compasses or digital compasses help a little bit, but still, I never use those. I'm just kind of by feel and the angle of the waves and just push them through the waves. Oh, you said you were, you know, you don't want to pack too many times, especially on the 16 on the first up on the leg, so you end up overstanding a little bit on the, on the, you know, the lay line? It could be. It all depends through. on the traffic. Yeah. So if you start on starboard, yeah. They don't want to have to pass two packs up close to the mark. Exactly, especially not as close to the mark there. Because, yeah, just, especially if you pass within a short period of time, that's even worse than having to use four packs within the whole way. Oh, I have another question. If we were going up wind on the second leg, and I thought I could cross in front of the guy, I didn't quite make it. And so, do you, can, can you wait and do your circle anytime on the course, or you got to do it before the next mark, or what, what's the rule on that? I think it's as soon as possible, as safely possible. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And so you know, the, the American stuff that was there for Yeah, the American stuff is whenever. different. You can do it whenever, as right. long as you, right before the finish. So you like see it's going to wait. Okay. Yeah. And then you're saying it's as safe as possible. Right. So it could be like a minute or two minutes afterwards, like if you're stuck in a situation where it's close to already, right. you can kind of get out of the way. So how do you know, um, speaking of that, if you're going to cross somebody or not? Is it just like looking underneath and saying, oh, we're going to close? Do you guys look at the land and if land's disappearing or if you're getting land? Does so, everybody know how to do that? Yeah? OK. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah. I was saying, I thought I could pass it, but it's yeah. so wrong. It's easy to play like this where you have all that land across you where you kind of see if you're gaining land on it or losing land. Mm -hmm. or, you know, 
make your decision pretty early as far as if you're going to have to duck him or something or slow down? Or... Um, not necessarily. I mean, especially on a lake, you get a lot of shit. So, well, we were coming together and we both packed. I mean, I packed and I thought I was going to you know, cross in front of him, but yeah. I didn't. I didn't at all. <laughs> yeah, especially. I mean, it's difficult when you're doing tactics with each other because you don't. Really
think a great example is when I was at the Pan American Games a couple years ago. We were in Mexico, and a windy day there was four knots. <laughs> and it was 110 degrees, and you're humid, and you're drenching water, you don't even want to be out there. So you wanted to go right, no matter what. Off the start line, you wanted to go right. And there's like 11 boats or something that are really small start line. And doing that one extra attack, I mean, four knots of breeze, and you're doing an extra attack that's probably like at least 10 boat lengths. So everybody was starting and started initially, just because um, that's how they set the start line, and everybody's kind of doing that same thing. And then my coach talked me in for some reason to try and work back. And uh, I was the first one to try it. And it worked okay. I mean, you're saving one jack and so you get going the right direction. But it just it just never feels right to me. And then after that, everybody started doing these four jacks. And the whole star line just turned into a mess. Yeah. Like, <laughs> five months, four out to three, started in starboard, five to the other five, started in four. And it was just like, ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the race committee, the, the guy that was running the races, could have done, should have done something about it. Just set the line a little bit differently to, to not let that happen because it just started turning into a protest after a protest. Uh, <laughs> guys that's exactly what they are. In bad the situation. So, I mean, there are times when you can do it, but it's just so hard. Poor favor to do it, but those situations are pretty rare. <laughs> We're all able to keep it small like it was today, and a lot of the things that you want to go to that right hand side. Yeah, even slowing down a little bit, and letting those boats across, and then shooting across the floor. Sometimes that works at that front, but it's really favorite, especially on the movie you've seen where you don't really want to go back to the In the uh, light winds, do you set the sails and you speak the boat? Up wind or down? Up wind. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, up wind. Set the sails. Up wind. Especially the jib. I'll set the jib. If it's really light wind, I'll probably set it a little bit closer <coughs> than the, like the medium or high wind setting. And then I'll steer up to that one. Depending on it, if it's consistently light, I'll just set the jib, set the mainsail, and just steer up to that. Just keep the boat going. Probably driving down on purpose a few degrees more than my normal level of course. Just to make sure that I don't have something to fire. Boat wakes coming, just make sure I drive off a little bit just to keep the boat going through the waves. Uh, but if it's puppy, you want to definitely uh, sheet your cell through the pups. So if you see a little bit of an increase in wind coming, you want to sheet in the jib a little bit, sheet in the main cell a little bit. And I'm not talking a lot on the jib, maybe like just an inch or something. On the main cell, it's maybe six inches or something like that. So you see a pup coming, you fill a pup, you sheet in a little bit more. Once that pup's gone, it flattens up again, sheet everything back out, sheet it off. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of playing with that going up. And it was, it was a little bit fuzzy. What do you do with your out on the line when you do that out, What do you do with your light your out haul in light winds? On which boat? Uh, let's just say a 20. A 20? Well my rule of thumb on pretty much any boat that has a Basically, there's a, a gap between the boom and the main cell, which is usually put in. So what I do, um, pretty much in all conditions, is we'll set the boat up on the beach, or by air, or whatever, and we basically, the boom's here, the cell's here, I want to be able to stick my hand in there. So where the deepest point of the cell is, the bottom, if I can stick my hand in there and have like five fingers, that's fine. Because, and then we never touch the alcohol. Except for maybe going down one in line with but we never count the alcohol because once you start getting more wind, you start pulling more downhole on. And when you start pulling more downhole on, that actually takes that trick out of the bottom of the cell. So basically, you could probably just set your uh, alcohol at that five inch or whatever that right. is, and then just leave it there and remember that for your upper setting. And then the downhole, you just get the wrinkles off the main. 
Um, in the light stuff, I would start with wrinkles in the mane, and then as the wind increases, as you need to depower more, you start pulling the downfall line. Okay. But the downfall is pretty much, except for on the OB-16, it's probably the most important main cell boat control that you have on the boat. I mean, it gives you power, it takes away power. It, it's, actually, it's pretty important on the OB-16 too, which I found. And basically, on the OB-16, it's the balance of your boat. So if you're having hill no changes, a lot of weather down, a lot of lower down, a lot of it is based on your downfall. I set up my OB-16, same way over mine, and then set the downfall based on the weather that I feel with my helm. And that can vary in all kinds of wind conditions. And that goes pretty much for the, the 20 and the 18 also, where it's a little bit easier to adjust, where you can do it on the trapeze. If you're flying a little too much, and popping up too much, then you pull a little bit down on, try to control it a little bit. If you feel like you don't have enough power, ease off the down ball, and that'll create a little bit more power in the shell, and help you power up and hopefully go faster. And, uh, yeah, there's main cell control, besides the main shield, really important, especially that down ball. So, on the 16, how loose do you ever run that down ball? Like, how far above the black line? Well, you know, I thought the black line and all the zells were pretty much the same, but the boat that I was sailing today, uh, I was pretty high up. Like, that first race today, I was just down from the, 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 the track we took the car in. Which is really high up, where on my boat in those winds, you get home, um, I would probably be about four inches above the black line. So today I was probably uh, seven or eight inches above the black line. On my boat, I was probably four inches. So, um, I'm not sure why that is. The manufacturer, I should know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would, I would uh, not base it as much on where the black line is as on what your cell is. Obviously, if you have wrinkles in the cell, if the cell is too flat or stretched on the front edge, I always like to start with wrinkles and then pull it down a lot slowly to take out those wrinkles just to give you kind of the general idea of, of where your downhole setting is, especially on the 2016 where you don't have the adjustment like the 2016. Yeah. Now on the 16, you can just, you just got like a cam fleet on it, you can do that now? You can. You can do a 6 to 1 or what's the purchase? 6 to 5 to 1 or 6 to 1? I think it's 6 to 1. Yeah. But you can't adjust it from the trapeze. It has to be a fixed block at the bottom of the mass that can't swivel. So you can only adjust it like if you're in the middle of the boat. So, like if you're going upwind, you can adjust it in between caps or downwind, in between drives or something. So, on your downwind legs, are you relaxing the downhaul on the 16? I don't have that system on this boat here, but on my boat at home, I do have that system and I am relaxing the downhaul. Yeah. Absolutely. Just power up the main a little bit more. How about an 18? Would you break that downhaul when it's like? If you're on the wire, you got a trim here, you can all adjust it, get above, crank that down all the way to the The way that I match the downhaul on, say, the OB20 or the OB16, is I always keep myself a little bit powered up, so being on overpowered more often than not. And I base the downhaul, once you're double trapped or single trapped, I base the downhaul on how much I'm playing the sheet or how much the hole's are. So the more the holes fly in, the more I'm going to cheat, the more I'm going to pull the downhaul on. Now if you're going up with it, it's 20 knots, or 15 knots today, and you're not ever flying the hole, you're not ever cheating out, you're not too much downhaul on. So you want to have some power in the cell where you're going to be popping the hole, you're going to have them cheat a little bit, but it's, um, overall, you want to have that power. Don't cheat the power too soon. Don't cheat, yeah, that's the worst thing. You want to be, in my opinion, you want to be more powered up Greg, what about mast rate? Um, how do you set your mast rate from like vertical? It used to be vertical for a while, but now it seems to be right back more. Yeah, I think pretty much all the boats now, you want to rate back as far as you possibly can. Even in ladder air? Even in ladder air, not just to get a wind or, yeah. Um, yeah, the sails haven't changed any. Like on the Kobe 16, they haven't changed. The Kobe 20, nothing's changed now, but it just seems like the evolution of all of those throughout the years, um, the rate is going further, further back, and like on the OB-16, 
16, we're coming up with smaller, smaller main sheet blocks, smaller shackles. Um, people are moving their, the, the, um, the hog ring on their halyards. They can pull their mask. Their cell up a little, like a half an inch more, which means they can break back a little bit more if they pull the more main sheet tension. So, um, I think on the Hobby 20, we didn't go all the way back. I mean, on the Hobby 16, you want to be blocked. Hobby 18, you, I don't think you guys are just blocked to block. I don't think we ever got blocked to block, but I think there's probably six or eight inches between the main sheet blocks. That sounds about right. And then for the Hobby 20, um, I think we were getting pretty close to block to block. That's about right. <coughs> find that depowers the boat too much? I mean, that's... Yeah, you, you got plenty of power in the main cell. Yeah, and I mean... Now, is that to stabilize the front end so you have to drive it in? Or no. Just the power of Just the power of it. And then there's enough cell. You get your power better. Definitely get your power better. Yeah. With the OB-16, it actually helps you steer it. Those of the rudders more. And help you steer. Makes you better. Mm -hmm. Like, if you start waiting forward, Maybe move it six inches total size. 
you know, sheet in more, or the, the top of the shelves to open, can you move the, the attachment on the, the tack plate? Move the plate, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're selling out there, just go down to the lower side to get a chance and really take a look at that. You can get a good idea of what that looks like, and it's pretty easy to, to see if it's right or wrong. So, so if you can't get that, if you don't have that tension on that gift hire on the gift sheet, you got to keep packing your sail up on that chain plate, and you can get it harder. Right? Yeah, and that's what I did today on my boat. Uh, so my boat at home, my jib is all the way down to the very bottom, and then I have to like struggle to get that jib sheet in to get it all the way block to block. And what I did today on that boat, the jib was like almost flogging. So, so I just like two or three holes at a time would move that up. I let off the jib higher. Does um, having the jib um, tack low help you point? Is that an advantage to have the jib tack as low as you can for pointing ability or is... Uh, I don't think it really has that much to do with it. Um, I think your mass rate, your sheet tension, your jam all, I think that has a lot more to do with pointing angle. Um, there's some guys that do believe like you have to have your jib down below as well as you have gap No matter what, he'll set his boat up so the jib is in the bottom hole on the tack, no matter what, and then he'll adjust the rest of his boat around that. So, um, but then there's other guys who think there's more power with uh, more wind that's fire, so you want to get your boat a little bit higher, so there's all different sorts of things. Okay. I think just that sheet tension is the most important thing on the jib. And back, back to the clue, I mean, do you play with the clue? Which where which adjuster hole you choose there? Is there a difference in lighter? Kind of same thing when you go down to the lure side and you look and you can see like if the top is really closing off and pointing towards the mainsail, the bottom's kind of open more. Mm -hmm. Then you would need to move the traveler bar move it down on the blue plate one or two holes. So you want to kind of have a consistent shape from top to bottom on that bleach. And I'd say just a general rule on the V16. Do you do any bat shaping on that? You know, like those upper bats on the 16th, so they're on the stiff, like flat. Do you ever like relieve them a bit with that pocket still press? Yeah. So on the the uh, 16 actually pretty much all of those that have a comp um, the top two or three bat on the main cell come from the factory pretty stiff. Pretty stiff. Uh, so what I do is I do shape down the top on the W16 and the top three back and thumb and so, and just shape like a maybe a, let's see. You, you just want to figure out where the, the draft is in the cell and basically forward and then you want to leave the, the rear part of the back pretty stiff so that the flow off the back of the cell is straight. You don't want a lot of